we would like to thank and acknowledge our sponsors, DC3 Dreams and Voice Astro. DC3 Dreams provides high-end observatory automation and web-based multi-user remote imaging. The AAVSO Net Observatories use DC3 Dreams ACP Expert for the Bright Star Monitors and other programs. The AAVSO Photometric All Sky Survey Project, also known as APAS, has used ACP Expert's AI scheduler to automatically acquire over 500,000 star fields, hands off, at a rate of 1,000 square degrees per night. This has resulted in photometry for over 128 million objects in about 99% of the sky. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education observatory resources and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Please check out their webpage to learn more about their work. All right, now, ladies and gentlemen, I am happy to report that today's speaker is none other than Mr. Tom Calderwood, one of our very own experts here in the AAVSO. He graduated from MIT with a degree in mathematics before working as a software engineer on a wide variety of projects, including the data system for the Chandra X-ray Observatory. He is now the leader of the AAVSO's photoelectric photometry section and has been producing some truly gorgeous photometry using PEP from his home in Central Oregon. Even if you're not hooked into the PEP world, it's still likely that you have heard from him recently, as he was the author of The Great Dimming of Betelgeuse, which ran as the feature article in the March edition of Sky and Telescope this year. It's Betelgeuse's recent misbehavior that he'll be talking about today, and trust me on this, you're going to want to hear what he has to say. So, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, I give you Mr. Tom Calderwood. All right, let's see if we can get the screen shared here. There we go. And okay, Lauren, are we all set? Yep, looks great here. Okay. So good morning, afternoon, and evening, wherever you are. I'm sure that you all know that last year, Betelgeuse had some very exciting behavior. And today I'll try to bring you up with the latest thinking on what happened. Just a note before we start, I am not a physicist. I'm just an educated amateur. What follows is my best understanding of the professional work. I'm going to gloss over some details and make simplifications in the service of clarity. Betelgeuse is a red supergiant star. It has exhausted the hydrogen in its core and is now fusing helium. That transition has made it swell up to enormous proportions. Placed in our own solar system, it would stretch out to about the orbit of Jupiter. Betelgeuse is unstable. It is pulsating and is nearing the end of its life. Here you can see the light curve for the several years preceding the dimming. You can see there's a definite pattern, but it's not perfectly regular. The star hits a minimum about every 400 days. Betelgeuse is really an enormous boiling pot, huge convection cells of hot gas rise from deep in the star, hit the surface, cool off, and then sink over a period of years. The hot spots on the surface of the star give off more light than the cooler areas. And in the illustration, you can see a model of what the temperature distribution was in the year 2014. Betelgeuse is cocooned in dust. The star is releasing gases out into space. And when those gases get far away, they can cool off and solidify into solid particles like aluminum oxide and silicon monoxide. Red supergiants produce a tremendous amount of dust, 
So they are important in the redistribution of chemical elements in the universe. The illustration shows the dust around Betelgeuse. The star itself is just the pinpoint inside the black circle. As Lauren said, I leave the, leave the AAVSO's photoelectric photometry section, and I like to brag that we get the best data on Betelgeuse. Here you can see the year of the great dimming and the year before and after. From the peak of that graph to the valley is about a 30% drop in brightness. Now those were the data in the V or visual filter band. Here's the complete collection of PEP data from the dimming, going from the ultraviolet to the near infrared. You can see that as the dimming, but you can see that the dimming becomes less and less pronounced as you go to longer wavelengths. There are some interesting quirks in those light curves. For instance, as the star approached minimum, the B band faded faster than the U band. And after minimum, the B band strengthened slower than the V band. If you subtract the B and V magnitudes, you get a color curve. The interpretation of a convex curve like this is usually that the star is slowly getting hotter, reaches a peak in February, and then cools down. But that doesn't make any sense because the star went to minimum light in February where it should be the coolest. I've not seen any explanation for these photometric quirks so far. But enough of the amateurs for the moment. Let's take a look at what the professionals have been up to. There are two prime explanations for what caused the great dimming. Either a new dust cloud formed, obstructing our view of the star, or the surface or part of the surface of the star experienced a big temperature drop so that it emitted less light to begin with. Astronomers using different telescope technologies come to different conclusions about what happened. Here's a quick summary of some of the important early papers. Andrea Dupree used the Hubble Space Telescope to get ultraviolet spectra of the chromosphere around Betelgeuse. She concluded that a bunch of material had plowed through the chromosphere, exciting new ultraviolet emission. That material could have condensed into dust and then caused the dimming later. Emily Levesque used an optical spectrograph and used the data to estimate the temperature of the star. She concluded that during the dimming, the temperature had not dropped very much. And again, therefore, dust was the likely explanation. However, Graham Harper, using narrowband photometry in a different part of the spectrum, concluded that the temperature had dropped considerably and that dust was not necessary to explain the dimming. Finally, Thavisha Dharmawardena used a radio telescope in the submillimeter band. She detected a significant drop in radio emission. Radio emission would not be expected to be affected by dust. Therefore, she thinks that a decrease in temperature is the likely explanation. In April, a really nifty study came out by Katerina Kravchenko. Tomography is the art of looking inside a place where you normally can't see. If you've ever been in an X-ray scanner, you've had tomography. Kravchenko used spectral tomography to look inside the motions of Betelgeuse. To explain how, we have to take a little detour into spectroscopy. 
astronomers organize stars into classes from O to M, with O being the hottest. Classes are further subdivided into grades from zero to nine, with zero being hottest. This illustration shows what the different classes look like in a spectroscope. You can see that the hot stars put out a lot of blue light, whereas the cool stars favor orange and red light. Each class has its unique set of dark lines, absorption features caused by atoms and molecules in the star. Within a class, the different grades have their own unique signatures of dark lines. This gives us fingerprints for the different classes and grades. Now the spectrum that of a star that we see comes from its photosphere. This is the outermost layer of the star and it's the coolest layer of the star. As you go further in, the star gets hotter. For example, from the outside, Betelgeuse looks about like a class M2 star. But if you went inside a bit, you would look like M0. Further inside, K8, K6, K4. Each of those layers has a characteristic spectrum and you would be able to see it if you had the right equipment. Now in most stars, you cannot see it. The interior layers are not visible at all, but the photosphere of Betelgeuse is very deep and very tenuous. This means that the absorption features of the inner layers can be seen through the thin outer layers. And this is how it works. Let's say you're trying to find the Ka layer. You start with a model of the K8 spectrum, and you also have the observed composite spectrum of the whole star. What you do is set the model spectrum on the left-hand side of the observed spectrum, and you move it step by step to the right, comparing it against the observed spectrum until they match. Now, what good does this actually do us? Once we identify the spectrum for say the K8 layer, we can establish its Doppler shift. If that layer is blue shifted, it is coming towards us. If it is red shifted, it is falling away from us. Here's the detail for one layer. The thick black line is the correlation between the model spectrum and the observed spectrum as you slide the model from left to right. As they come into agreement, the correlation reaches a peak. The gray line represents the neutral Doppler shift, a layer that would be neither rising nor falling. If the peak of the correlation lies to the left of that line, the layer is blue shifted, it's coming towards us. If it lies to the right of the line, the layer is red shifted, following, falling away from us. The further the peak is from that line, the faster the layer is moving. Kravchenko identified five different layers in the photosphere. I've labeled them M2 to K4, but I think those are not in fact the actual layers she found. During 2019 and 2020, she followed the movements of those layers using a high resolution spectrograph. This is a simplified representation of Kravchenko's data. For each date between January and April, I have identified whether a layer is rising, rising slightly, neutral, sinking slightly or sinking. As you can see here, the innermost shell was rising during that whole period. The next shell up started out stationary, 
began to rise a little bit and then was fully rising. The middle shell was actually sinking in January until it reversed course and began rising. Likewise for the next shell. And similarly for the top shell. What you are seeing here is a shock wave moving through the photosphere. In January, that wave is in the innermost layer, pushing it up and then bang, 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 bang. It successively hits all the layers above it until they are all rising. Now in May, Betelgeuse disappeared behind the sun and Krauchenko picks up the story in the fall. In November, the bottom layer is still rising, but it quickly runs out of momentum. The next layer up rises for a while longer than it too falls. Likewise for the middle layer. The next layer up is manages to rise for a considerable period longer before it starts falling. And the top shell lasts longest of all. What you are seeing here is the shock wave moving out of the photosphere. Each layer in succession is a relaxing back down. Now from the spectroscopy, Kravchenko also estimated the temperature of the star during this time. She saw a peak in March of 2019 and a trough the following February. This makes perfect sense because as the shock wave hits each layer, it compresses that layer. And when you compress a gas, it heats up. The maximum temperature occurred as the wave had compressed all of the shells together. And this also corresponds to the peak in the light curve as you can see down below. Conversely, the minimum temperature occurred when all the layers were relaxing. This result meshes nicely with the Hubble data from Andrea Dupree. She used the spectrograph to study the chromosphere above the photosphere in Betelgeuse. The spectrograph saw a burst of ultraviolet activity in the fall of 2019. That burst corresponds to this point on Kravchenko's timeline. The interpretation is that the shock wave is starting to move out of the photosphere and is hitting the chromosphere, shocking that layer and causing a boost in ultraviolet light. All of this is very strong evidence that there was a mass ejection, that, you, that Betelgeuse spit out a bunch of material. But did that material actually condense into dust to block our view? In order to do that, the material has to cool off quite a bit. And generally speaking, that means it has to get two stellar radii away from the surface, away from the center of the star. Kravchenko says, no, it couldn't have got that far in the time allowed. She thinks that the material remained as gaseous molecules, and it was that dense molecular cloud that actually obstructed our view of the star. This very week, Miguel Montarget came out with an important paper in Nature. He used the very large telescope to get high resolution images of Betelgeuse before and during the dimming. Betelgeuse is close enough and big enough, this is possible. In these images, you can see the evolution of a dark spot, a spot that is either on the surface of the star or above it. 
in his analysis, he, com he created computer models of both a dust clump and a temperature drop. And he compared the evolution of those models over time with the images that he took with the telescope. He concluded that either model would work to explain what we saw. But he prefers the dust model. When light bounces off of solid particles, it becomes partially polarized. And other observers saw a big increase in polarized light. Hence, dust should be the preferred explanation. He puts a slightly different twist on the mass ejection. He suggests that after the material left the star, the photosphere beneath that material cooled down. This was like turning off a heat lamp on that material. And it was able to cool and condense into dust and do so much closer to the star than it normally could have. AAVSO observers played a role in the analysis. This diagram shows three spectral models. It shows some black circles that are photometry from the Very Large Telescope. And it shows some gray triangles that are AAVSO photometry. The J and H band data were taken with a special photometer that my group uses. This device collected the only regular infrared photometry of Betelgeuse during the dimming. And the H band data were important enough that Miguel devoted an entire diagram to showing them. But there are some puzzles. The J band infrared data don't actually agree with either the dust or the temperature drop model. And I'm not so sure that the H band data really agrees with the dust model. Where does this leave us? None of the investigators have directly detected dust. All of the indications are indirect. If there was a new dust cloud, we should have seen a boost in infrared light, but nobody saw that. The temperature drop explanation is still viable. And we now have this new possibility of molecular obscuration as the reason for the dimming. Next week, the European Astronomical Society will hold its annual meeting. They'll devote most of a day to discussing the great dimming. Hopefully we'll see a spirited debate and maybe the resolution of some of the questions. I'll close with another nifty development. Otmar Nickel is an amateur astronomer in Germany. He has been experimenting with daytime photometry of Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is bright enough that you can see it in a telescope during the day. So in principle, that means you can measure its brightness. The daytime photometry is not as good as the nighttime photometry but it has the advantage that you can do it during the summer when Betelgeuse is near the sun. As you can see here, Otmar shows that the brightness of the star has been increasing steadily since it hit a minimum at the beginning of May. If you want some more background, as uh, Lauren said, there's an article in Sky and Telescope that goes into a lot of the early details about Betelgeuse, and I think you'll find it interesting reading. And with that, I thank you for your attention. We have plenty of time for questions, so don't be shy. Uh, Lauren, I think you're muted.
Thanks. <laughs> I was muted. I have a little hardware mute button that hits my desk sometimes. <laughs> um, so thank you very much, Mr. Calderwood. Uh, I would like to second what he said. Let's get some audience questions in because I've got quite a few and I don't want to monopolize this Q&A. <laughs> so let's see, our first one is coming from Sebastian Otero. It says, uh, hi, Tom, you mentioned that the temperature drop is not refuted, but the BV curve, as in B minus V curve you showed, didn't seem to support that. Uh, is it that the drop may show up in other bands besides B and V? Okay, so the temperature drop, the, the scientists who are measuring the temperature drop are doing so by examining titanium oxide absorption features in a high resolution spectrum. Um, the broadband photometry um, is a puzzle, but it is not nearly as convincing in terms of establishing an actual temperature as the titanium oxide analysis. Uh, one thing that happens with titanium oxide, the absorption, is that um, as you get a lot of, of absorption, as the temperature gets low, the absorption in B band becomes more, excuse me, the absorption in V band becomes more pronounced than the absorption in B band. It doesn't affect the two bands equally. And so that could be an explanation for why the curve has that convex shape. Um, but I've not heard this discussed among the professionals. Not that I get to listen to their telephone calls. <laughs> Thank you, that's a good answer. Next question comes from Jeremy Veldman, who has asked, do we know the velocity of the shock wave as observed by Andre Dupree? Uh, I think, um, Kravchenko obviously has some handle on what she thinks the velocity is. Uh, I don't recall offhand what it is. Um, the motion of the layers, um, you know, when we see the layers moving up and down um, is on the order of about five kilometers a second, up or down. Um, I, don't, I don't know the physics of shock waves well enough to to understand whether that means the shock wave itself was traveling at that speed, um, but the layers were being accelerated or decelerated by about five kilometers a second. Wow, very impressive. All right, um, so our next question from Bradford Ferguson, who has asked, what kind of photometer does Otmar Nickel use? And if uh, he's, he's actually not using a photometer, he's using a CCD camera. Okay. And the uh, second question from Bradford was, if this is, uh, if he's doing differential photometry, how does he see comp stars during the daytime? Okay, he's not doing standard differential photometry. Okay. Um, what he's doing is observing the few really bright stars that are available and is constructing a graph that tells him what the zero point of his camera is. Um, this is kind of an artificial, if you like, um, comparison star. Um, it's a little bit involved, but he is not doing directly differential photometry. Okay, very interesting. And uh, do you know somewhere, if, if someone was interested in doing a similar thing, is there a place that they could go to learn more about that technique? Oh, uh, Otmar is working on a paper. So that Excellent. will hopefully come out in JAVSO sometime this year. Excellent. All right, and um, I should also mention, I'm aware that the uh, the Bright Star Monitor section um, on at least at least once in the past, they've experimented with doing photometry of bright stars like Betelgeuse during the daytime using their um, CMOS camera rigs. And uh, they have a webinar coming up soon. So if you're in the audience and you're interested in that, um, you can probably ask the Bright Star Monitor experts during their webinar. All right, so next question. Um, in your opinion, how, how important is it right now for observers to continue monitoring Betelgeuse? Do you think the event is over or is this a, uh, do you think it's likely that uh, that dust, you know, if it was a molecular cloud that blocked out the light, is that gonna condense into dust and create an even greater dimming? You know, 
how important would you say it is for our observers to, you know, it's pay special attention to keep on watching it. it? But it's difficult. It's a difficult target for people with cameras mm -hmm. because the star is so bright. That's true. And I fully expect, for instance, that Katerina Kravchenko will continue her tomography. And uh, right. Andrea Dupree has uh, applied for more Hubble time. So, okay. you know, the professionals are still following this as closely as they can. I think that's wise. So it sounds like it would be a good idea for AVSO observers to continue following it to support those studies. Okay. Uh, and so speaking of um, people with cameras have difficulty, but not so much for photometers. Um, if someone is wanting to get into PEP, can you give uh, some places to go learn about PEP and how do you get started? Well, you could go to the, the PEP group has a, um, a page dedicated in the AAVSO website. That would be sort of a first place to go to get a feel for what we're about. That's a good recommendation. I was just checking that out recently and you guys have a good manual there. So um, definitely go check out the PEP observing section page. Now our next question comes from Sandipan Bortheker. I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Um, who said that many AGB stars show oscillations in their outer layers. And do you think that that could be at play here? Um, I don't, uh, I don't know well enough. I will say that Kravchenko, um, first practiced her tomography a couple of years ago on an AGB star. Um, so, I mean, that's certainly this for, for red supergiants, this technique of following movement in the layers is completely new. Um, so we don't know how pervasive it is or the level of its importance in the behavior of the star. Okay, thank you. Um, just to add on to that real quick, there was a uh, conference that was recently uh, concluded, the GAPS 2021, GAPS 2021 conference on um, uh, red giants and super giants. And the uh, sessions, some of the presentations talked about those types of outer layer oscillations and um, the recordings are available on the GAPS 2021 YouTube channel for free. So if you're if you have a deep interest in that, you might go check it out. It's all professional level talks. Um, all right, so our next question uh, comes from an anonymous attendee who had asked, since we are doing daytime photometry, I'm assuming that there is no space telescope on the other side of Earth's orbit at uh, L3, Lagrange point. Is that true? Uh... I can neither confirm nor deny the presence of such a satellite. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that sounds uh, slightly suspicious there. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question. What will happen if Betelgeuse does go supernova? Um, it will get very bright. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's expect, nobody in the professional world is expecting that to happen. Yeah, at least not in the next few years. Right, in, 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 in our lifetimes. Right, yeah. Um, oh, one thing, if you don't mind if I add on to that, um, one thing that I find to be really cool is, you know, um, during a solar eclipse when the, the, there's just like a little bit of Bailey's beads left and you start to see these atmospheric ripple patterns on the ground from the fact that the sun is now a point source. And so there's these projected patterns like on the bottom of a swimming pool. When Betelgeuse goes supernova, that's going to happen because it'll be a very bright point source. So if only it'll go supernova in our lifetime so we can all see that. All right. Um, let me see the questions here. Uh, oh, yes. So if there are any uh, spectroscopic observers in the audience, um, what kind of resolution are we talking about to be able to support these professional studies? Are we talking about uh, being able to do it with slitless, or do you need to go to and like an L high res at like R sixteen seventeen thousand? Like, what approximate range are these okay. professionals? Okay, so the tomography was done at about <clears throat> an R of eighty thousand, eight zero thousand. Okay, very high resolution stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so you really need, you know, even if you're not trying to be that detailed. You need, you know, tens of thousands um, of R, so to speak, mm -hmm. and you also need an appropriate range of wavelengths. 
you need to get out certainly to 8,000 angstroms. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, what about for measuring the titanium oxide band depths to try and get the temperature? Do you know the approximate requirements for spectra doing that? Um, well, again, that's the, um, let me just quickly share my screen and show you a supplementary slide. Okay. Okay, so here is the spectrum or the two spectra from Emily Levesque. One taken in 2004 when the star was fairly bright, one taken in 2020 when at just about the, the maximum dimming. Um, it's a really jagged spectrum, and those notches that you see in it are basically all titanium oxide. Mm -hmm. Now, you can see that this spectrum goes from about 4,000 to doesn't quite make it really to 7,000 angstroms. Um, this is a more complicated diagram, so, so bear with me a little bit. Um, this was in the paper by Graham Harper, um, who says, yes, there was a big temperature drop. These are three model spectra. One is a high temperature spectra. One is a low temperature spectra. And one is a spectrum of a mix of high and low. So you have part of the star hot, part of the star cool, okay? Up here is marked the range of the Levesque spectrograph. You can see it's only coming out to here. And you can further see that between those two points, these two spectra look pretty similar. They're not that different. How would you choose between a high temperature saying that the star had not cooled off and this composite temperature? very tough to say. The photometric filter that Harper's team is using is all the way out here at 7100 angstroms, mm -hmm. where there is another big titanium oxide feature. You can see that the mixed spectrum has a big dip there, whereas the high temperature spectrum has only a small dip. Okay. Harper can see this dip, Levesque cannot. Mm -hmm. And this is why they can come to different conclusions about the temperature. Um, the equipment that Harper's team is using is actually PEP equipment. They're using an 11 inch telescope with a optech photometer and specialized filters. Cool. All right, so I think that uh, answers the question of saying that you definitely want to get out there into the near infrared if you're shooting spectra in an attempt to measure the titanium oxide bands, you know. And um, it looks like uh, I just know from experience that there is a um, telluric water band that imprints on that that diagnostic deep titanium oxide there whenever we're shooting from here on Earth. So uh, it may be necessary to look into correcting uh, the tellurics out of your spectrum if you're trying, if you're an amateur spectroscoper who's trying to study that. Um, there are ways to do that with, I think, the ISIS spectroscopy software. For those of you who aren't familiar with telluric, that means water vapor. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, it means found in Earth's atmosphere. There's both water vapor and O2 you have to watch out for contamination for, unfortunately. Um, all right, so next question uh, coming from an anonymous attendee had asked, what are the basic needs of astrophotography? And we'll take that in the context of in an attempt to measure Betelgeuse, like when you're trying to do photometry on a bright star. How should you start, I guess? Mm, that's really beyond what I can describe. I don't use cameras myself. I just use photometers. Mm -hmm. I don't okay. take pictures. So I can't really comment on how best to start up in uh, imaging photometry. Okay, so in that case, I will add a comment, which is that we have actually had um, a couple different webinars on getting started with uh, different methods of measurement. We have a really great webinar by Barbara Harris on uh, using a DSLR to do photometry of bright stars like Betelgeuse. So if 
you're interested in getting started, that's probably the easiest way to go. That recording is available on the AAVSO's YouTube channel. Just search uh, YouTube for AAVSO HQ. And we also had a uh, webinar on getting started in the CCD photometry. So if you already have a CCD or a CMOS camera, you can go check that out. Now, uh, speaking of CCD and CMOS and all of that, um, I know you don't do camera uh, photometry yourself, but can you make a, a, some kind of statement on how useful are these um, these data points coming out of cameras for these kind of light curves? Because I know we've seen the PEP light curves. What are the what are the the uh, CCD like light curves like? And is it uh, plausible like? If you have a CCD on a telescope, is Beetlejuice simply too bright to shoot, or can you shoot it anyway? It is. It is for the most part a very. It is so bright that it it quickly saturates cameras. Mm -hmm. You have to be very careful about your exposures. Um, I've seen some bad photometry by very experienced people um, who just weren't careful enough. Um, mm -hmm. So. It's, uh, I mean, th this is one of the reasons why I use photometers. I stick to, to bright stars. Um, some, some people are able to get, you know, reasonably good data, but it is hard. Okay. All right. So that sounds like uh, it's worth trying it, but you want to be careful when you do and make sure that you're avoiding saturation. That's the warning I'm hearing there. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, all right, so next question comes from Timothy Weaver, who has said uh, that he has trouble doing photometry of bright stars with his six inch reflector because of saturation. His CCD pixels get saturated, but you need a telescope in order to be able to see Betelgeuse during the daytime. So how do you avoid this catch 22 of observing Betelgeuse during the daytime without saturating your CCD? Do you need to use special filters? Okay, so what? Um, he, uh, Otmar did in fact use a neutral density filter. However, what he primarily took advantage of was very short exposures, like on the order of a tenth of a second, or maybe it was even a hundredth of a second. Mm -hmm. He has a CCD with an interline shutter, so he can take extremely fast exposures, um, and, which, and then he stacks a bunch of them together. So that's how it's done. That's a... Uh... That's a good method right there. Short exposure stacking is getting easier and easier with today's cameras. And I know um, that's possible with the CMOSs as well as interline CCDs. So good answer. Now, uh, next question is coming in from Jean Bruno Desrosiers, who says that they noticed on the Optech site that the SSP photometer is no longer available. Uh, where right. can we so, go get a photometer nowadays? So almost. Um... I have uh, bought optic photometers on the used market for years. Um, mm -hmm. They pop up every now and then on eBay, on Astromart. Um, I think many of our observers are using uh, used equipment. Um, mm -hmm. They don't require much in the way of maintenance. We can still get filters for them. Um, you just have to have some patience in terms of getting your hands on one to begin with. Um, but I don't see that there's any difficulty in keeping the photometers working for the indefinite future. Okay, that's good. And uh, I know it's used, so it varies, but do you know the approximate price range when these usually pop up? Well, there are different models of the um, SSP3 photometer. The, um, the SSP3 uses a photodiode as its sensor. Um, and the photodiode is actually not very sensitive, but that makes it perfect for Betelgeuse. Mm -hmm. um, the typical photometer has a photomultiplier tube in it, which is um, much too strong to use on Betelgeuse. Um, but uh, the, the SSP3 came out in at least three different models. Um, I use one of the very oldest ones. Um, I paid about, $200 for it. However, I had to replace the filters um, because they degrade over time. And um, then you're looking at maybe another $150 or so. Um, so 
that's sort of, you know, about $350 or so is about a base price for a working unit. Okay, that's not bad um, for the kind of accuracy you're getting. Now you're talking about these filters, are those uh, standard photometric filters? Right, Johnson filters. Mm -hmm. And they come in, are, are, do you put in like standard housing uh, or is it is it custom for the photometer housing? Uh, the the filters no these are not one and a quarter inch filters they're actually only half an inch in diameter um, a photometer you aim it at only one star at a time it has a narrow field of view and so it okay. only needs a small filter okay interesting All right. we have been buying i have been buying filters lately from the chroma corporation in vermont okay and before before Optech discontinued the photometers, that was where they had switched their source of filters. Okay, good to know. I know that there have been uh, issues with finding filters in stock recently for the Johnson Cousins one. All right, uh, it looks like that's about it for our questions for now. So if anyone has a question that they want to get in, go ahead and type that out real quick. We're going to wait one minute, and then if there's no more questions, we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, okay, that's a that's a broad question, but we got a question come in from Aditi Pather who asked, how do you start with astronomical spectroscopy? Um, do you have any comments, Mr. Calderwood, or should I take that one? I can't. I've, I've never done any spectroscopy, so I can't comment on that at all. Okay. Oh. Uh, spectroscopy is my main method of observing, so I'll comment on that. Um, so there's several different ways to get started, depending on the equipment you have. Uh, you should go to the AVSO website, check out the spectroscopy section. We have one of those as well as a PEP section. And also go to our YouTube channel. There is a recorded how-to hour in which I presented kind of the most basic way to get started with spectroscopy. Um, just you need some really simple equipment and a telescope. Any telescope doesn't have to have tracking. So that's called, I think, uh, how-to hour DIY spectroscopy on a budget or something like that. So just go to the AVSO YouTube channel, it's there and it walks you through step-by-step. Step. And uh, feel free to drop by the spectroscopy forums on the AAVSO site if you want some help. Also, we have a mentorship program, so there's that. Okay, and okay. Uh, uh, Chitra Singh had, has now asked, um, do you have any comment on searching for asteroids? Nope, no comment. Okay, yeah, so that uh, I think is a little bit out of the AAVSO's realm of expertise since those are rocks and not stars. We tend to be looking at stars, um, but I know that there are amateurs who do uh, participate in asteroid search and follow up. Um, the Minor Planet Center is one place to go to find information and also check out, I think there's the SAS and check out your local astronomy club. Um, to get more information on that. Okay, and uh, one more question about, um, is there a minimum aperture for using a PEP photometer? Uh, you want really at least eight inches. Okay, that's um, good to it know. Can, there are some targets you can do with smaller telescopes, but um, if you don't have at least eight inches of aperture, then you're pretty significantly limited. And okay. even with eight inches, it's hard to do work in the B filter band, the Johnson B band. True, not much flex there. So, so it's, for... it's common for PEP observers to have 10 inch telescopes. Okay. So for and Betelgeuse, so, what would you say the minimum aperture is? Cause I know that's quite bright. You could, um, you know, we have someone who's doing it with a five inch refractor. Okay, All right, um, that's not bad. Not bad. Um, we'll answer that one in a minute because uh, that's a little bit off topic. All right, so I don't see any more questions about photoelectric photometry or Betelgeuse, so I'm going to go ahead and put up the end card and we'll wrap things up. One second. And there we go. Okay. Uh, so I would like to extend 
A huge thank you to Mr. Calderwood for sharing his time and knowledge with us today. I would also like to thank again our sponsors, DC3 Dreams and Voice Astro. DC3 Dreams provides high-end observatory automation and web-based multi-user remote imaging. The AAVSO Net Observatories use DC3 Dreams ACP Expert for the Bright Star Monitors and other programs. The AAVSO Photometric All Sky Survey Project, also known as APAS, has used ACP Expert's AI scheduler to automatically acquire over 500,000 star fields, hands off, at a rate of 1,000 square degrees per night. This has resulted in photometry for over 128 million objects in about 99% of the sky. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Now, if you are sitting there after this webinar wishing that you could go back and reference all of the great information that Mr. Calderwood just shared about Beetlejuice and maybe see some of those paper names again, you are in luck because today's webinar has been recorded and the recording will soon be made available for free on the AAVSO's YouTube channel, where you can find a full library of webinars just like these. I know quite a few have been mentioned already. The uh, spectroscopy one, the DSLR one, the CCD one. We have a lot of good information there, folks. So go check it out. And while you are there, please consider subscribing to our channel. Not only will you get a notification every time a new educational video is posted, but by hitting that little subscribe button, you'll be making YouTube more likely to suggest our videos to others and helping us increase our educational reach. That's just one more way that you can help support the AAVSO. Speaking of support, this webinar series is being supported by you, the viewer. So please, if you're not a member, join the AAVSO. AAVSO membership comes with a wide array of benefits, including free access to our mentorship program. So if you're wanting to learn how to make your own magnitude measurements and join the effort to monitor Betelgeuse for another great dimming, then our mentors can help. And as always, we would be so grateful if you would consider donating to the AAVSO. Every donation matters and goes towards making programs like this one come to life. <laughs>